pre-meeting. Uh, For as long as people have called this place home, they've been welcomed with clean air, clean water, and an abundance of nature. As time went on, people saw the need to balance how we build cities with how we protect farms and forests. That's why across Greater Portland, in 24 cities and three counties, there's one metro government that brings us all together to maintain that vital balance, to provide services across cities and counties, to create a better future together. Hello, we're Metro. We plan for housing, jobs, and safe transportation. We protect land, air, and water by managing garbage and recycling. We support arts and culture by overseeing local venues to keep the economy growing. And we connect people to nature across 17,000 acres of parks and trails and at the Oregon Zoo. Metro is all of us working together, connecting how we live today with how we plan for the future. Hello, we're Metro, and so are you. <coughs> All right, I'd like to call to order the uh, Metro Council work session of May 2nd, 2023. And Connor, will you please call the roll for attendance? Yes, thank you, President Peterson. Uh, Councilor Gonzalez. <coughs> President, thank you. Nice to see everyone again. <laughs> you as well. Councilor Lewis. Present. Councilor uh, Wong. Present. Councilor Rosenthal. Present. Councilor Simpson. Present. Councilor Nolan. Good morning. Present. Good morning. And President Peterson. Present. Thank you. Uh, before we begin our agenda items, Connor, will you please play the in safety, the in safety, the in <laughs> safety message for the in-person attendees. Thank you. I'm Micah Reese and I'm the dive safety officer here at the Oregon Zoo. And safety is a big part of my job. Some of the things we consider here is diver safety. I'm out here at the Oregon Zoo and you're at the Metro Regional Center. The council chamber is located on the third floor of this building. In the event of fire or fire alarm, please exit through the door in the northeast corner of the room, go down the steps to the second floor, and exit through the main entrance by the reception desk and gather in the courtyard outside the entrance. In the event of a medical or fire emergency, please call 911 and notify the security agent at the front desk. The nearest defibrillator is mounted on the steps leading from the reception desk down to Grand Avenue. Thank you. Great, with that we will uh, get going with our presentations. We have two budget presentations today. The first one being the diversity equity inclusion department budget. Uh, we have uh, Cassie Salinas to present the department budget. Come on up. Sorry, there's more than that. Everybody come on up. You're the next. <laughs> Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Metro Council President Peterson, Metro Councilors. I'm Sabrina Owens-Wilson. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Regional Impact Program Manager for the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Department and have been co-directing along with Cassie during um, the uh, leadership transition that we are in. I'm joined today by Cassie Salinas, 
Organizational Impact Program Manager, Robin Briggs, Central Services Finance Manager, and Holly Calhoun, Deputy COO. As you all know, this year has been an important year for the EI program. We became a department. Um, thank you, counselors. Um, we, uh, we've had this transition has created a lot of opportunity for us to reflect <coughs> and to start to build a foundation for what is going to come next in the next iteration of our diversity, equity, inclusion work. Um, even in the midst of change and transition, including a leadership change as well as staffing changes, we believe we are still well positioned to deliver on the impact and build out the next phase. And most importantly, continue to advance racial equity and ensure more marginalized voices are centered in all the work we do as an agency. What you will see in our proposed budget is a culmination of our best thinking alongside feedback from key stakeholders and change makers from within the agency as well as outside to meet our commitments, to support innovation, and to meet community needs. Next slide, please. Today we're gonna do an overview of um, the DEI program priorities, our budget overview, our equity metrics, budget modifications, and then our investments in the target areas. Next slide. As you all know, our work is guided by the strategic plan to advance racial equity, diversity, and inclusion, which was adopted by Metro Council in 2016. The DEI department is structured to, um, into two program areas in order to implement the strategic plan. I lead the, racial, the regional impact team, which is focused on embedding racial equity strategies into our policies, programs, and investments to build toward a region where all people can thrive. I'm honored to be joined in this work by Andre Bueller, Workforce Equity Project Manager, and Amy True, Civic Engagement and Outreach Coordinator, as we develop and advance racial equity strategies, workforce equity strategies, and grow access to family sustaining jobs and careers, particularly in the construction industry. We work with departments and agency-wide to embed racial equity strategies that deliver concrete benefits to BIPOC communities. And we build pathways that elevate the voices of BIPOC leaders in Metro's decision-making processes through our management of the Committee on Racial Equity and grants that are expanding civic engagement opportunities in BIPOC communities. Hello, buenos dias, Metro Council President Peterson and Metro Council members. My name is Cassie Salinas and I use she, her pronouns. I've worked in Metro for almost 11 years and I've hold, held a multitude of roles while I've been working here. But I sit here today as the Organizational Impact Program Manager and join Sabrina Owens-Wilson as the Acting Co-Director for the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Department. I oversee a very diverse portfolio of work, and I do this work along a small yet amazing and mighty team of staff who help to make Metro a more inclusive, equitable, and welcoming place, centering diverse and marginalized employees. We help to foster a deeper sense of belonging in the workplace and increase Metro's capacity to producing racial out equity outcomes. Leadership Development Coordinator Nyla Moore, Equity Analyst Sabrina Tina Catalina, Metro's first Accessibility Program Manager Heather Busick, and Melly Palafacino, who provides admin support to my team, and I all do organizational change work in a variety of ways. We work in partnership with many, many colleagues in central services, including human resources, communications, finance, COO's office, employee comms, to help shift hearts and minds, as well as provide tools and resources to help make Metro more equitable. My team oversees our equity literacy efforts to increase staff's capacity to lead this work. You may have heard of our retention tools and leadership tools like the employee resource groups. We currently have three, um, right now focused on supporting staff of color, our black staff, and our pride ERG who are encouraged to participate up to two hours of paid time each month in meetings. They get a chance to advocate for change and also find moments of joy together. We will be expanding this opportunity with an increase in our budget for up to two additional employee resource groups this next fiscal year. And our team is getting better 
at measuring our impact and tracking the action steps taken in the strategic plan to advance racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we will we'll be preparing for the refresh of the next iteration of the strategic plan. And we're setting up for a new program to ensure that we're in compliance with Title II with the American Disabilities Act, making sure that the disability community is centered in our planning and programming efforts. We do this plus so much more and I am honored to do what I do. But our team is truly bigger than us, and we can't do this work without our many partners and friends without the agency, as well as our de dedicated racial equity leaders at Metro who are passionate about achieving racial equity and justice for people of the global majority. And we have much more work to do. Next slide. Over this past year, my team has focused on systems change, changing practices, changing policies, and the ways of doing business at Metro. As I mentioned, we've hired Metro's first accessibility program manager, Heather Busick, who started in November, who's building on the existing compliance efforts and internal systems established by many of my colleagues, some that are here, some that are not here today. Um, I wanna call out Nathan Sykes in OMA, Kayla Martin in the COO's office, and many of those who helped us um, complete Metro's first ADA transition plan and to help us better coordinate Metro's accessibility work. Heather will be engaged in the, with the disability community and will kick off our first accessibility advisory committee later this year. My team and I have embedded a racial equity analysis, or rather the use of a racial equity framework in the agency, which has been utilized in dozens of projects and programs at Metro. And as you all know, this is year two of utilizing the budget equity tool for our budgeting process. It's been a wonderful opportunity to forge partnerships with our finance team to integrate this new analysis into our systems and practices around Metro's budget process, providing more transparency and more engagement on, for our most impacted staff. And in partnership with HR, we've reviewed and updated new employee policies with frontline workers in mind and have rolled out mandatory DEI trainings, expanding our offerings to online as well as in person which I will speak to about the impact later. And we've been hosting virtual meetings with racial equity leaders and change makers, which we call the Racial Equity Leadership Table, a resource that we launched during the peak of the pandemic to help build relationships across departments and support better coordination of racial equity efforts. These are just a few of the key priorities we focused on and will continue to fund and resource in the coming year. And now I wanna hand it over to Sabrina to talk about her team's work. Thank you. So in the coming fiscal year, the uh, regional impact team will continue to build towards systems change across the region. We will partner with project teams across the agency to advance racial equity strategies through community benefits agreements, application of the racial equity framework, and workforce equity strategies on significant regional investments like the interstate bridge replacement, urban growth boundary, Willamette Cove and uh, Parks and Nature Bond implementation. We will continue to be a regional convener for construction careers, supporting our regional agencies in their implementation and coordinating through the Regional Collaborative Committee, which raised $2.9 million for workforce development in its first year and managing the collective oversight structure for the workforce agreement. Our efforts to advance shared prosperity will focus on getting to the impacts of construction careers on Metro's projects, getting the impacts on the ground in terms of jobs and investments. We are really invested in making sure our systems are effective and we're supporting contractors and being successful. We will also continue our work of exploring a sector-based good job strategy focused on green jobs that builds on the success of construction careers and coordinates and leverages the collective efforts of the departments to create good jobs with career ladders. Finally, we will be focused on um, pathways to decision making. We continue our work to build and strengthen pathways to support community members in accessing our decision making processes through our management of CORE, which council appointed eight new members to last week. Um, and continuing to build the civic engagement capacity building program, which is investing in five organizations that are growing and empowering BIPOC leaders across the region. The through line for all of this work in the coming year is gonna be the update of the strategic plan, mm -hmm. which we plan to initiate um, and we'll begin with a thorough evalu evaluation of the current plan. 
Please me. Next slide. Prior to becoming a new department in the fall of 2022, we held conversations with various key stakeholders and department directors to better understand key priorities from their point of view, and specifically how to best align our staffing with agency and community needs. As a newly formed department, um, we held these staff engagement sessions early on, and we did a review of our upcoming budget. And based on this feedback, this next fiscal year's budget reflects these priorities. I want to now hand it over to Robin to speak to our budget in general for the next fiscal year. Good morning. I am Robin Briggs. I am the Central Services Finance Manager. I use she, her pronouns. You've just heard about the many, many programs that DEI is responsible for here uh, within Metro and then out in the region. To perform that work, we have proposed a slightly over $3 million budget for DEI. The bulk of that budget will support the 11 FTE of $1.8 million. The total materials and services budget is $1,163,000. I'm thinking of it in two parts. The first is $425,000, which are grant awards for civic engagement and capacity building. This goes to the five separate organizations that are performing this work. The remaining $738,000 is the operating and program programmatic budget for DEI. That funds the programs and functions that they're engaged in, and it's the basic operating needs, computers, training, staff development for the internal staff of DEI, as well as the outward-facing work that's performed. There are several modifications to the DEI budget. Um, we will talk about those in a later slide, but those numbers are included in these numbers here that I'm presenting. So I will turn it back to Kathy to discuss um, the equity impact. Okay, next slide. First, we want to acknowledge and thank our tremendous staff who helped ensure each department has an equity metric identified in this year's budget. I want to give a huge thanks to Sabrina, Tina, Catalina for her support, as well as our partnership with FRS, including Patrick Dennis, as well as our former staff, Reed Broderson, and a big thanks to Brian Kennedy, Cinnamon Williams, and Andrew Scott, Marisa Madrigal, and for their leadership in supporting all the amazing, and all the amazing finance leaders that have helped us along the way. This has been a great first step to help us better measure our impact, particularly in our budget work. So you may know, we're here today. We took a little opportunity, we asked if it was okay to speak to more than one equity outcome for each of our respective program focus areas. So I'll start with the OI metric, and then Sabrina will speak to the racial, um, regional impact uh, metric. So we can go to the next slide. As you may know, we provide learning opportunities that increase equity and inclusion competencies for all of our staff and also for our elected officials and for our community partners. Over the years, we've provided hundreds of hours of trainings with leading experts on educators on topics regarding privilege, unconscious bias, disability and accessibility, gender equity. These are just of the few topics. While my team supports all of our staff in increasing their knowledge in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion, this past year, we focused on measuring the percentage of Metro supervisors and managers who had participated in de mandatory DEI trainings. Managers play a critical role here in helping create a more welcoming and thriving workplace, and it can make an employee's experience rewarding, challenging, or worse. So our equity metric was based on the percentage of managers or supervisors who've attended a mandatory DEI training with a target goal of 80%. And just to give you some perspective, we have around 140 or so plus managers at Metro. We wanted to highlight this training, we wanted to highlight a training effort that we know HR will be discussing with you later in their budget presentation, but wanted to emphasize a particular training called Supervisor Essentials, Tools for Inclusive Leadership. It's a series that helped managers and supervisors and directors go deeper and reflect on trauma-informed principles and ask participants to learn more about power dynamics and power structures in the workplace and provide these managers with tangible tools and resources to build more inclusive teams. I'm really proud of the Supervisor Essentials Tools for Inclusive Leadership curriculum that my team helped co-develop with our friends in HR. This work was done in true partnership with staff Robbie Cotterell, Lauren Nixon, and Chris Martin, as well as Julio Garcia, who provided leadership support and guidance in this effort. Keep in mind, we launched this series during, virtually during the peak of the pandemic. 
My, help, my team helped to ensure the development of the curriculum was informed by findings and feedback from recent employee surveys and also from our employee resource groups. And Nyla Moore and I helped to identify and secure new DEI trainers, review curriculum, draft employee marketing material, prepare trainers for the training, and even led some of the trainings ourselves. And I'll tell you, we witnessed real-time aha moments of transformation in many of my colleagues and recognize that we are all on a learning journey of undoing the internalized impacts of white supremacy and racism, including myself. Managers really appreciated the series and opportunity to learn from the presenters on topics that mattered most to them. And the series helped bring managers from various parts of the agency that wouldn't have otherwise met or connected or collaborated together to share best practices to make their teams more inclusive. And I helped lead a debrief session with a couple of the managers. And my favorite part was hearing how managers had already started implementing ideas, such as changing the way they structure their team meetings. We know in the coming year, we're going to have to need to look deeper into behavior changes in our managers and supervisors to see how the training series and other mandatory trainings are truly helping our leaders to be more equipped to advance racial equity and inclusion. And we will be further developing metrics and evaluation methods and increasing accessibility, particularly for frontline and variable hour employees, and adding more DEI trainings for all of our employees. I think I had it to you now. Okay. Next slide, please. For the regional impact um, equity goal, we are focused, the, the goal that we're reporting on is for construction careers, coordinating regional jurisdictional partners and industry stakeholders to advance and implement the construction careers regional framework in order to create career pathways for women and BIPOC workers into the construction industry. So born out of, the, of a community ask um, in the strategic plan, our work is, continues to be focused on convening and leading the regional strategy that is capturing the full benefit of public investments and capital projects by ensuring BIPOC and women workers can access the life-changing careers the construction industry offers. We now have nine jurisdictions in the region that have made policy commitments and are implementing construction careers, working together to set and achieve diversity goals, invest in workforce training and wraparound services, shift job site culture to ensure workers have a safe, harassment-free, and welcoming work environment, um, and track and report progress and stay at the table to problem solve and learn together. This slide I am particularly excited about because there is a new partner on this slide, which is TriMet, a critical partner to have in this work, a recent addition, and we're looking forward to continuing to build together with them. Next slide. So the metric that we're reporting on is the total dollar amount of capital projects covered by the Regional Workforce Equity Agreement. The development of this agreement was led by Metro's DEI team in partnership with the City of Portland and Multnomah County, and this is one of the first multi-jurisdictional workforce agreements in the country that is rooted in racial equity. This agreement includes full implementation of construction careers pathways, the full suite of workforce equity strategies, and pairs it with strong protections for BIPOC and women-owned firms. This fiscal year, the Construction Career Pathways Regional Workforce Equity Agreement will cover $723 million of public infrastructure projects. One of the 13 projects have broken ground and the rest will start construction in the coming year. So by this time next year, we will be bringing the numbers and the stories of BIPOC and women workers whose lives have been impacted by this investment. Next slide. For budget modifications that are included um, in our proposal, our first budget modification is to extend the Civic Engagement um, Capacity Building Grant Program Manager position through the completion of the pilot grant cycle that ends um, in June 2024. Our second um, modification is resources to support community engagement, communication, and storytelling efforts for the strategic plan to advance racial equity, diversity, and inclusion update. And the third is one-time funding to support exploration of a green job strategy in coordination with the Climate Justice Task Force and other DEI initiatives. 
Next slide, please. For the investments in target areas, so the DEI budget includes investments and programs in council's economy and environment target areas. For the economy, construction careers includes um, in the DEI budget $50,000 in dedicated technical assistance funding that will focus on supporting BIPOC and women-owned firms in meeting the goals and requirements of the policy. We will administer in coordination with capital assets, $175,000 in investment in workforce development, which will support outreach, recruitment, and retention of BIPOC workers on Metro projects. In partnership with Planning, Research, and Development, we are managing a 2040 grant that is supporting a community development collective of organizations serving black communities in planning for a black worker center focused on transforming work conditions for black workers and growing civic leadership. And then we will continue our work to strengthen equitable recruitment and um, retention strategies for Metro employees. For the environment, as mentioned in the budget modifications, DEI will explore the opportunities for um, agency-wide coordination around green jobs and career pathways. And as we've discussed um, the update uh, for the strategic plan, we have identified climate and displacement priorities um, for the update. The strategic plan update really is an opportunity to develop and embed a unified strategy for how we're advancing racial equity in each of the target areas. We look forward to working with council in our collective effort to achieve better alignment. And that concludes our presentation. Next slide. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good overview. Much appreciated. Um, counselors, any questions? Uh, Councilor Simpson. Thank you, uh, Council President. And thank you, DEI staff, for that, uh, that amazing presentation. So much good work going out into the community in such short time. So thank you. Um, one question. I have a few questions. But the first one is, uh, you know, are we, what's the idea around expanding to include more school districts in the region, um, particularly in those hardest hit with, um, you know, kids being lost to street violence and things like that? In construction careers There's in particular? Bad. Yeah. Um, so we had, um, when we developed the framework, um, there was at least one more school district that was at the table with us. And so um, we are kind of continuing to do outreach beyond the, the folks that have implemented. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to continue to build with the school districts and would love to talk about how we, we can coordinate on some of that strategy. Absolutely, especially with summertime coming up. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, my next question has to do with the trainings. Mm -hmm. um, is there a timeline to completing um, like the fundamentals training and the inclusive mm -hmm. training? Because I, I saw 33% for supervisors on that yeah. um, leadership training and I, I feel like that's pretty low. So what would it take to get a supervisor to 100% and how long? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it depends. Right now, we've required that uh, managers need to go through a, a, this this foundational training and then this the tier two. And we're exploring <laughs> ways to make it more accessible and ensuring that all of our managers know that they need to participate. Uh, it takes it's a it's a it's a large commitment. I can't speak to the hours of time, um, but it is at least a nine part series. Um, for, for our manager to participate. So definitely we're gonna be exploring ways to communicate, to be working with our directors to ensure they understand the value of why these types of trainings need to be um, completed. And then we've been working with <coughs> HR on offering more trainings that are um, focused on this type of inclusive leadership to provide uh, online tools. So many of these trainings could be done in person, but we're trying to look at the both hybrid option. So I do think it's a bit around um, ensuring there's communication. We definitely have the requirement set, and that occurred, uh, I think, late last year, uh, that we now know that we want managers to have this type of just baseline training. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Right, we've got, uh, just about every counselor has a comment or question, so we'll go around. Uh, Councilor Lewis, uh, Gonzalez, Wong, and Rosenthal. 
Great, thank you. Um, thanks for a really straightforward budget presentation. I feel like I know what's in there. Um, my one question is around the capacity building grants. We'll be entering year three, and if memory serves me, that was our commitment. Um, have we thought at all about funding evaluation or an external review so we know what to do next since we'll be at the end of these uh, first grant promises um, by the time we're at our next budget? Yeah, this year is going to um, really focus on the evaluation of the program um, so that we can make sure that we are providing the information I think the council will need to, in order to consider the future of the program. I think another priority for this coming year is really going to be creating opportunities for um, our counselors to engage with the grantees. They're all doing really great work. Um, and, um, you know, it's taken a little while to get um, the program stood up. And so this year, um, we really want to um, have a focus on like the impact that this funding is creating. Great. So does the budget include external resources for outside eyes for the evaluation or is it all in-house? Um, I think we were planning to do it in-house. It didn't include external um, review, but um, I think we can consider that um, in, in part of that one-time funding if, the, if that is a priority. I just think it's a best practice for something yeah. so new and so innovative for sure. just to get an external player to give us our own interviews. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councillor Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, President Peterson, and uh, sincerely appreciate the presentation. And to think about how far the department has come since I joined the council um, in terms of capacity, recruitment, the talent that we have. Um, you know, I think it, Metro has demonstrated uh, some tremendous leadership at a regional level and uh, across the state. And so, for me, like the the presentation so far is. Has has, it, it has helped me think about it in a way of like how do we not just you know be comfortable with being in the lead in terms of the work that we're doing, but how can we con continue to push the the bounds? Uh, and that uh, I also do want to really appreciate um, uh, Cassie and Sabrina. Thank you for uh, for uh, really like listing all of the people in your teams and who you work with, and just like bringing bringing everyone to the table in that way, I think is really, really special. Um, my question um, with obviously the department being in a, a period of transition with, with Rahi leaving, um, I, I'm wondering, you know, wh what would you say the most, um, uh, the, the, the challenges that you faced during COVID and how will those inform your work kind of in this new phase of the region, the economy, and 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 you know that taken all of everything that we heard from our community partners, from industry partners, to where those opportunities lie, um, and you know you, you're very, you're a visionary leader, so I I just want to kind of tap into that. So I think challenges that um, that we um, faced during COVID, I think um, uh, not unique to the DEI team, but I think going from being very connected and um, together to being dispersed um, uh, in a remote work environment um, for much longer than anybody expected um, was was certainly a challenge. And I think some of the things the that that we did together we weren't able to do. And I think that, you know, as we kind of continue to be built back, a priority around really supporting the team is gonna be um, incredibly important. Um, I think we we also moved a lot during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, we and we uh, negotiated an entire workforce agreement during those two years um, in partnership with other agencies. We got it, we're, we were implementing it. Um, and so I think we also learned a lot about um, 
what we can do and how quickly we can move. Um, and uh, the need for us to also make space to be responsive to what's happening around us. And I think that there were a number of initiatives such as um, you know, reimagining policing mm -hmm. that we just had to make space for that wasn't on our work plan. And so I think that as we kind of prepare for the next iteration of this work, how do we create a plan and a direction that provides enough structure for us to move forward, but that doesn't limit our ability to be responsive to the community needs that we may not expect. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to add, I think, you know, during the peak of the pandemic, a lot of us on the DEI team and our racial equity champions were innovating and testing and trying out new tools and resources. And so I think we have an opportunity to kind of slow down and look at what, what has been working, um, measure that impact, share those resources and, and really have um, more application of those. I think about the racial equity framework as a perfect example of how can we apply that more intentionally to some of our other bigger projects that we have on the horizon. Sharing those resources with other community partners and other agencies I think would be a great, a great step. And then also sharing more of our impact. I think um, we've, we've done a lot and I think we have a great story to tell and I hope that we can continue to inspire other jurisdictions to be a part of this journey because we're on a journey for sure. Very good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Huang and then Rosenthal and then Nolan. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Cassie and Sabrina, for your leadership. Um, first, I just want to say, you know, the privilege of attending the core get together last week, yeah. and uh, we welcome eight new core members. So, thank you for a phenomenal job for recruiting new folks from across the region. You know, as someone that was on core for four years uh, prior to assuming this position, I'm just really excited that. We have so much energy there. Um, I really do feel like CORE is kind of uh, the heart and soul of our engagement and equity work. Um, we, we have a lot of technical experts that come in and serve on community or committees, but CORE is really, I think, where we uh, really center our, our uh, focus on the community. So thanks for that. Um, just some, some things I wanted to um, maybe put a seed in for for strategic planning that's that's coming up. You know, I think we're we're seeing some debate and pullback from investments in community capacity building from some of our jurisdictional partners. And for me, I mean, I just want to be clear that that's not something that I would be supportive of. I really want to see us to continue to invest in community capacity building and you know supporting kind of efforts where we can do better engagement over time and get better input. Uh, so that's just something that's been on top of my mind. Um, and then uh, just great work on all the C2, P2 things. I really like the um, investment in looking into green jobs. And I might also put a plug in for looking into you know, how do we develop a social services sector and mental health sector that also, you know, reflects you know, the communities that we want to serve. Uh, I think that that model has been successful and could be applied in a lot of different sectors that Metro touches upon. Uh, so just some things to, to consider during strategic planning, you know, really prioritizing community capacity building and also other areas where, where we could really make a big impact. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Rosenbaum. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the good presentation and for the hard work. I mean, I've seen Metro do quite a bit of transitions and this new department is doing good work and, and adding more uh, facilities. And so I think it's really, you know, we're making good progress. Um, I have two sort of theoretical questions, which I don't really expect you to answer today. I'll, and I'll actually provide partial answer to one of them. The first question is, considering that Portland is changing rather dramatically in terms of its diversity over the last, in my time here, it's changed amazingly. But so how do we measure overall success and performance going forward in considering things are gonna to continue to change? And the partial answer to that is, uh, I represent a couple cities that have, shall we say, less diversity than many of the other areas, uh, and, and yet they seem to have fully adopted 
the kinds of DEI strategies and concepts that we have. And so that's a partial answer, but I think for the, the core of the area and a lot of the other areas, what is how do we measure this going forward? And then I have one other question that, uh, at what point will we change our conceptual paradigm from construction career pathways to construction and management career pathways? Um, and is that appropriate? But thank you. Those didn't require answers at this point in time. <laughs> we can... <laughs> Are we going to follow up then? So I think um, for how we're um, managing or measuring success, um, I think that um, over the past year, we've been working on uh, a, a kind of unified approach to how we're measuring our racial equity work. Um, through results-based accountability. I think we have a lot more work to figure out how we're going to apply that. Mm -hmm. um, but for that to be a measure that, a, a way that we can get really clear on um, who's better off because of the work that we're doing. Um, and so I do think um, there's definitely some opportunity there. And, um, you know, um, I really appreciate your comments about, um, you know, some of the cities that have less diversity that have taken this work on. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, in some ways that's, a, that's, that's kind of the, it's an interesting story for the, the, the region overall. When I kind of talk to other, um, uh, you know, people from other parts of the country um, and and the I think the strong leadership stance that we have taken on racial equity, um, even though we don't have the the, the most diversity, um, I think we have managed to do a lot here and shown a lot of leadership. And I think that continuing to build with um, all of the jurisdictions of different sizes is um, going to be really important. Um, and then on your comment around construction and management pathways, I mean that is. That's, that's the dream. It's, it's not for supporting contractors and workforce being in tension with one another, hmm. but that our, our efforts to open the door to the industry are about opening the door all the way up to management. And so um, I think that's a really interesting thought. Thank you. Anything good? OK. OK. Good. Great. Councilor Nolan. Thanks, Madam President. Um, batting cleanup means that many of the um, acknowledgments and praise um, for the work you've done has already been made, and I want to echo what my colleagues have talked about in terms of successes. I have a couple of specific questions. In your regional um, metric, I think it was slide nine which talked about the $723 million. I start from a premise that the objective, similar to what you were just talking about, is for there to be jobs and careers in construction for women and BIPOC people that are comparable to the proportion that white men enjoy. Um, and I know that that, I don't have to explain that to you, but I just want to be clear about the premise. So I'm interested in knowing what percentage of um, public construction work in the region does that 723 million represent? Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage you to think in terms of a goal okay. as soon as we can, within a couple of years, that we bring in enough partners so that we pretty consistently, this program represents 80 plus percent of the public construction work going on in the region. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should stop there. I think we should consider in the future bringing in private construction and aim to have a program that trains and prepares and introduces women and BIPOC people 
to have careers in private sector construction as journeymen, as apprentices, as site supervisors, as owners. So I, I will, again, I just put that out as something to think about. I'd like to see something bold and aggressive. Um, and I guess that's not a question, Madam President, but I do actually have it. Well, the question was, and if you can get back to me with it, the percentage that the 723 represents. Okay. And shifting our concept to percentage of the market mm -hmm. instead of just number of partners. Yep. Appreciate the other that. question actually goes to our COO. Um, and it gets back to the organizational metric. I believe this slide was seven, the 80%, the target of 80% of supervisors completing mandatory training. Um, the training's either mandatory or it's not, and in my mind, mandatory means everybody prioritizes it enough that they get it done. Um, and I'm wondering what tools or maybe what budget issues or support you and the other departments need to make 100% participation <clears throat> feasible within the next year. And I'd also like to, because I think language matters, <clears throat> I'd like to suggest that the goal, our goal should not be just the percentage of supervisors and managers who attend the trainings, but we should expect ourselves to have 100% attending, absorbing, and practicing the lessons of those trainings. Thank you for this question, Councillor Nolan. I'm gonna uh, pass it off to our Deputy COO, Holly Calhoun, in, in one moment to address some of your questions. But I wanna back up a little bit. This is, you know, I, I think for me, having, having equity metrics is useful um, in many ways, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And so let me back up and just tell the story of this, of this training and why, uh, why we do it and why it's important. So um, studies show that uh, a person's manager is the single most important factor in their workplace experience. Mm -hmm. Managers have a lot of power to create a great environment that's productive and healthy or do the opposite and have a toxic, dysfunctional uh, place. Mm -hmm. And so we know that if we target managers for improvement and really look at the uh, the management skill set as a separate skill set from whatever subject matter expertise they had in their field that we can improve our overall workplace. And so totally agree. We've re we've recognized that, and an, and until this training, there wasn't a focus on that in our um, in our in our in, in Metro's um, training. So this is you know this is a great metric, but I would say it's a first step. And I and I agree with you. Mandatory trainings are should be mandatory, it should be 100%. I think that the, um, we've been doing this maybe two years. It launched in March of 2021, so we've only had a short period of time of having this series available for our managers and supervisors. That's right. And, and so roughly how many managers are there at Metro? How many a, people does this apply to? Around 140. 140, okay. Right. Yeah. 30 or 40? 140. 130? Yep. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, we will get up to 100%, you know, barring at any one time with new managers coming Before in. Before we talk on this subject next year? I'm sorry? Before we talk on this subject next year in the budget? Um, yes. I mean, I think okay, that's absolutely achievable. Um, and I think, you know, the only reason why it wouldn't be is, again, if there's turnover and we're measuring in a moment where, you know, people haven't had a chance to right. take it yet. Yeah. Um, but Holly, I'll, I'll hand yeah, it over Thank you, you. Councillor Nolan. Holly Calhoun, Deputy Chief yeah. Operating Officer. Um, the 80% is based on turnover. We calculated average to have a reali realistic metric. Um, the benefit of it is that we have now developed reports so we can actually look at participation and overlay it with turnover. So ideally we can increase that percent to a higher percent moving forward. Um, to your point around other qualitative measurements, yes, we want to overlay this with employee engagement survey results. Yep. Are folks experiencing a different relationship both in their work and with their supervisors? Great. And then I think uh, Julio, our HR director, might be speaking to an HR, HR dashboard. 
where we are also focusing on turnover or more importantly retention of employees of color and other non-dominant identities. So I think these are relational metrics that we need to be looking at in partnership. And I do agree, I hope that that 80% can increase to a point that is realistic based on turnover. One final comment. Realistic is a pretty mamby-pamby term. I want to encourage us to aim for ambitious, bold goals. And frankly, I would rather you aim for a really um, you know, landmark kind of goal and not quite get there than aim for a, oh yeah, we can do that easily goal and surpass it, me personally. Absolutely, appreciate that. Okay. Um, with that, I guess I just wanted to thank you all for an amazing year of work <laughs> and, and over COVID. Um, you, you did get a lot done. Um, and I think we're growing um, a, a lot of the programs and understanding and being able to have quite an influence region wide on making some progress there. Um, I think the one thing that just how does your budget reflect maybe this conversation that we had started to kind of just have the conversation around um, as Rahi was leaving around how we work with the region around the notion of shared prosperity? And have you thought about any of that? Because I think we, you're not at the point where we have found a lot of the barriers and remove them within our own organization, working with the region to remove a lot of barriers. Not that we have done it all. <laughs> There's still a lot more to do. But how do we also bring in the educational element for people to be in the same room together and learn from each other? Where I, I feel like it, we have that opportunity to do that kind of cross-fertilization and let people like work out really tough problems together. Mm -hmm. How do we move in that direction, or how does the budget move us in that direction? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I know that um, I think will be important for the DI team to continue is um, Rahi was bringing together the um, equity officers from around the region. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, continuing that work, I think it's such a powerful group of leaders and there's so much opportunity and I think that um, it, on any project, on any of the work the DEI team has done with a regional partner, the equity office has been a key partner and I, so I think that um, um, that could be a place where some of that shared prosperity conversation could, could live. I think also um, I think that's a great space for the education components, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think kind of as we get through the transition, I do think that there um, is some opportunity to pick back up that space and, and think more about that work. And I would echo that everything Sabrina said, but that you know we've got dollars set aside for our training budget, and we always or we like to look at ways to leverage those resources to share those learning opportunities and we do open our doors to many of our partners to sit alongside us as we do more training. Does that, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the universe of the entire region um, and so does that include, I love all that, but does it include when you're talking um, partners, is that jurisdictional partners or is that the broader definition of like businesses who have DEI directors and businesses who want to know mm -hmm. what we're doing and how to get involved and how to bring it to their company and, and right I, I'm looking at the broader mm -hmm. conversation mm -hmm. we've got we've got a lot of partners in the region and I'm not sure mm -hmm. that we're we've reached out just from capacity sake <laughs> that we've reached out and been able to touch and work with everybody so that they're all being brought along of a, an, with an understanding of what we're trying to achieve mm -hmm. yeah. to, to decrease misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just encourage you to think about that. And obviously it's a capacity issue because mm -hmm. that's a big task. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but as we move forward and we start to grow, I would think that that's one of the spaces that we would want to grow into and think about. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. 
Thank you. President Peterson. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up shared prosperity. I think that that's, that's one piece of the application of a racial equity lens is mm -hmm. asking mm -hmm. who, who is benefited by this decision and who is burdened by this decision. Um, and I think that that to me is the exciting work of this team and um, the council's framework and the guiding principles that we have because at every decision that we make, we have an opportunity to ask that question and then make a decision that um, is toward a more equitable region. Yeah. So, And I think just being able to communicate what that means um, is important because uh, it's we're trying to figure out the regional benefits and costs to the entirety of the region and be able to articulate that. Um, so I think that with your help, that would that's great. But I also think being able to go out to people and not just have them come here and look at our decisions, but to be able to go out and talk about the, the, the larger issues at play within our region with these lenses, I think is important. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank look you. forward to that work in the future. For that, if there are no more questions, <laughs> except this question. Nicole has one. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. We'll wait a couple of years for what that question is. But. <laughs> um, with that, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, and we'll move on to our next budget presentation, which is the Oregon Convention Center. And we have Greg Stroud here to present the OCC budget. Thanks, Craig. There's news out there. <laughs> there is. <laughs> Big news in our state Sad is happening news. right now. Apologies. Um, with that, moving on, Craig, welcome. And uh, go ahead and start your presentation on the budget for 2023-24. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, good morning, Metro Council President Peterson, counselors. I'm Craig Stroud, he, him pronouns. I'm the executive director of the Oregon Convention Center. Joining me this morning are Michelle Hedegaard, OCC Director of Equity and Belonging, and Will Norris, our finance manager, and on the end is uh, Steve Falstick, General Manager of Visitor Venues. Next slide, please. Our presentation agenda is on the screen, and as you can see, we intend to cover four primary areas in our presentation with the majority of our time uh, reserved at the end for council discussion. Next slide, please. Some key things you're gonna see throughout our presentation are shown on this slide. Uh, with that, we're gonna jump right in so we can save time at the end. Will Norris will now present our overall base budget. Thank you, Craig. Uh, next slide, please. I'll begin by noting um, the unique development process that the Metropolitan Exposition and Recreation Commission, or Merck venues, go through. This proposed budget for OCC, shown here in millions of dollars, is the product of a Merck budget retreat in December, followed by two committee uh, meetings early this year, um, and finally approval during Merck's regular uh, March meeting before being rolled into the Metro proposed budget. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the majority of the Oregon Convention Center's resources are self-generated charges for services. These are primarily from um, items like space rental, technical services provided to clients, parking, and food and beverage sales. Continued recovery and demand is expected for FY24, both from an existing backlog of events that had to be delayed during the pandemic, but also from new business being booked through current marketing efforts. OCC has experienced some exceptional uh, event performance this past year, but it has come to some degree in fits and starts. For instance, March's charges for services were OCC's third highest month ever, uh, uh, since FY 2014, even adjusted for inflation. But overall charges for services for the current fiscal year are still below FY 2019's level. The um, FY 24's charges for services are budgeted at roughly 90% of their fiscal 2019 level. Continued growth over the next fiscal year will come as the center continues to fill uh, its calendar on a steady basis. Next slide, please. Uh, the center's second largest source of revenue is lodging taxes. 
Rapid lodging growth uh, rates associated with the COVID recovery are expected to taper off as lodging revenues uh, begin to approach their pre-pandemic levels. The proposed budget expects lodging taxes will return to their pre-COVID trend line by about early 2024. This will put lodging taxes roughly on par with FY 2016-2018 levels, but still about 15% below their fiscal year 2019 level. If this uh, projected growth is obtained, OCC's lodging allocation for operations will be met and approximately $1.7 million in lodging taxes will accrue dedicated to capital projects. Next slide, please. One of the primary trends apparent in the budget is the challenge to rehire to meet the resurgent demand. The line graph on the slide shows the number of hours worked by month at OCC by all employee types from pre-pandemic through this March. You can see rebuilding staff is a much slower process than shutting down operations. Apart from one minor budget modification that Michelle will talk about later, the uh, proposed budget doesn't add authorized positions, but it does fund prior existing positions held vacant during the pandemic and budgets for variable hour employee cost needed to meet the anticipated events schedule. Next slide, please. The challenge rebuilding staff in the context of returning demand has in part to led to operating surpluses in the prior and current fiscal years. Hiring and onboarding is expected to catch up in fiscal year 2024, producing a $1.4 million budgeted deficit. This is a relatively minimal and manageable deficit, particularly respective of the $7.8 million surplus in fiscal year uh, 2022 and projected $4.8 million surplus this current fiscal year. The budgeted operating deficit is the product of both conservative revenue estimates while also bus, uh, budgeting for sufficient flexibility for OCC to react to the current dynamic demand environment. Next slide, please. Moving to capital projects, the FY24 budget also proposes to make substantial progress on a backlog of projects paused during the pandemic, as well as several new emergent projects that have come to light in the past year. Several of the largest projects include uh, waterproofing projects to alleviate leaks identified during last winter's storms, continuing to reseal the spires and crescent, refreshing the food and beverage facilities, and also security improvements like ele uh, electronic door access control improvements and creating front of house security, uh, creating a front of house security presence that's readily visible and available to patrons. Next slide. Overall, the proposed budget authorizes an $8.2 million utilization of fund balance, four-fifths of which are for capital project investments. Staff believes this is prudent given that fund balance has grown by $10.2 million over the last two, two years and given um, the urgent need for capital investment in the OCC facility. Um, so with that overview of the base budget, I'll hand back to Craig to talk about OCC's key at equity metric. Thank you, Will. Next slide. So OCC shares Metro Council's desire to ensure the center is convening and supporting diverse groups. And while last year was not a full year of, of events due to the pandemic, the percentage of specific diverse group events increased from 11, or excuse me, 8 to 11 percent. Next slide. These events rep represent more than 17,000 guests at OCC and are the sp excuse me, specific diverse groups using the center representing 16 different events in fiscal year 23. Next slide. This is a photo from one of the two US Citizenship and Immigration Services ceremonies. Over 500 individuals from 81 countries became US citizens at these two events with more than 3,400 family and friends in attendance to celebrate with them. Next slide. Another diverse group event, La Femme Magnifique International Pageant, hosted for more than 500 people. Pictured here is local celebrity Darcel, who passed away March 23rd, aged 92. Darcel will be the first Portlander to be inducted into the National LGBTQ Wall of Honor. Next slide. But that's only a small portion of the diverse group use of the center. As we reported last year, tracking diverse group business is challenging due to how groups self-report themselves. I asked my team to review the totality of events this fiscal year you can see from this short list of examples that groups and clients are fundraising for local community needs, supporting people of color, nurturing small business owners, and celebrating union jobs at the center. 
all told diverse group, community, and small business use of the center will total about 220,000 individual visits in fiscal 23 across 65 discrete events. That's roughly a third of OCC's overall event activity. Next slide. This group photo was taken during last December's Providence Festival of Trees. This nearly week-long festival in OCC's massive exhibit halls includes opportunities for school and community groups to tour the elaborately decorated trees and holiday displays. The event caps off with a dinner and fundraising auction, which raised $1.2 million in support of children's health initiatives. Next slide. We continue to work diligently with Travel Portland to, to court diverse national clients to Portland. I'm excited to share that in mid-April, we met with NAACP client representatives in Washington, D.C., and were invited to prepare bid proposals for their national conventions in 2028 and 2029. This is just one of many examples of diverse group national convention clients that we're working hard to bring to our region. In addition, a few months ago, OCC achieved the financial stability to hire a sales manager to focus on local and regional business. That position will directly support our efforts to bring diverse local groups into the center. And since we're talking about new hires, from September 22 through March of 23, of roughly the last six months, OCC hired or promoted 29 full-time positions from entry level to director levels. Of those 29 positions, 13 were people of color and 15 are women, so about 50% of our hires. We continue to hire and promote a diverse work workforce using our FOTA approach. The last bullet on this slide speaks to our efforts to support certification office for business inclusion and diversity suppliers and contractors. This speaks to the money we spend in our region, as well as our contract food and beverage partner, Levy. Next slide. And now I'd like to hand off to Michelle Hedegaard for the next few slides. Good morning, Metro Council President Peterson, counselors. I'm Michelle Hedegaard, I use she, her pronouns, and as Craig said, I'm the Director of Equity and Belonging at the Oregon Convention Center. It seems hard to imagine that the Convention Center was intermittently closed to the public until just 15 months ago. But as we've rebuilt our teams and reopened over the past year, we've focused resources and completely revamped initiatives to support the employee hiring and onboarding process. Our solution helps funnel all the administrative tasks of the onboarding process, as well as the relationships and associated tasks with Metro HR and IS into a single role, what we call our employee experience coordinator, pictured here, Anderson Trone. This allows managers and support, uh, supervisors more time to spend building stronger relationships with new and existing employees through intentional and thoughtful engagement, and in turn, ultimately allows OCC to deliver its mission and strategic priorities more effectively. Next slide. Another significant OCC initiative is the development of, or the deployment, excuse me, of our digital devices to our frontline workers who are not desk-based. Given the remote work technology advancements that blossomed during the pandemic, many of our systems and processes became web-based. This technology shift opened the opportunity for OCC to provide the same technology I use at my desk to those working in and around the center. Because in the past, many of these teams relied on paper resources or verbal instruction to perform much of their work throughout the day. Um, but through this initiative, frontline staff now have iPads and individual email addresses. They're provided the training needed to for this technology and have access to ongoing support for it. Can, can I just, there, can yes. we just take one minute? That's a round of applause, honestly. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the yeah. biggest things that could have happened since I've been here in four years. I mean, th that's the top news of the entire four years. So thank you. Thank you. I know that that's been a problem for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, just being able to communicate um, and get real time information and uh, just thank you. Thank you. I just, like, I haven't been happier in a very long time. <laughs> Great news, thank you. Um, well, they would, they would agree with you. <laughs> um, and uh, additionally, um, this gives workers, uh, t um, we ensure that workers are given workday time during their time, during their shifts, to use the iPads beyond work assignments to access employee news and information and communicate with others at Metro and OCC, just like me. 
Um, this investment also provides access to Metro's on-demand online learning opportunities where there was once a barrier. This program continues to evolve and we're excited for the improved employee experience that not only contributes to the workplace experience of individuals, but also contributes to the overall success of the organization. Next slide. OCC um, has only one budget modification request for fiscal year 2024, a full-time training and development coordinator position to provide enhanced support to OCC staff <coughs> that would be focused on designing, developing, and implementing programs to support uh, employees at OCC. Um, this would help to strengthen employees' existing job skills, ensure upskilling opportunities are available for jobs that require new or greater skills, um, and along with managers, uh, this position would identify job opportunities for employees and support their interests and aspirations through coaching and other professional development support. And, and we're going to continue working to build upon our inclusive technical ecosystem, which aims to close the technology gap. That is the goal. Because we know that upskilling opportunities help to lead to in-demand, upwardly mobile career paths. And while this is our only budget modification for 2024, we know you are watchful of our continued actions regarding our racial equity action plan. And I'm excited to share a few of our year four upcoming projects and initiatives that speak to that work. We are currently embarking on a community engagement initiative to inform us on ways to increase the number of events held at OCC by BIPOC communities and through understanding the barriers these potential groups face and ways we can support them. A likely challenge for many is cost, but there could be other probable factors as well, such as the scale of the center compared to their smaller activities, culinary desires, and client-specific needs. Before 2025, we are also working to authentically address the historical harms related to OCC's location and status as a government entity by creating a public-facing, community-informed, and community-co-created educational display on the history of the Abana neighborhood. And lastly, we're in the early planning stages of creating large banks of all user restrooms on level one at OCC for use by any person, regardless of sex, gender identity, or gender expression, insurance compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Thank you for your time, and I'll pass it back to Craig. Thanks, Michelle. Um, what is not shown on this slide are a series of actions and plans to enhance public safety at the center using existing council authorized positions and spending authority. This fiscal year that we're in right now, OCC reclassified three vacant positions to public safety agents and created and hired a new leadership position, director of public safety. These four positions bring the total OCC public safety team to 15 individuals plus variable hour agents. And as Will mentioned, we have three projects totaling more than $3 million in fiscal 24 and 5 <clears throat> that are focused on public safety. They are upgrades to our digital camera system, creation of a front of house department public safety console and office, and safety enhancements to our main entrance at the Martin Luther King Jr. entry. Next slide. This final slide shows the overall economic impact, jobs supported, and taxes generated from events at the Oregon Convention Center. Fiscal 2019 was the last full year of activity prior to the pandemic. In fiscal 22, we were just reopening to events and meetings, and the center's economic impact dropped $400 million, with nearly 4,000 fewer jobs and $15 million less in state and local taxes. I really want you to know that we in Travel Portland and our local hospitality partners are actively working to reverse this trend. There have been some amazing wins recently. The National Education Association's 2025 annual meeting and representative assembly with forecast economic impact alone of 18 million and 35,000 hotel room nights is confirmed for July of 2025. This is Portland's largest convention booking on record. Next slide, please. That concludes our formal presentation and we'd be happy to take questions. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, Councilors, any questions? Councilor Lewis, and then Simpson, and then Gonzalez. Sure, thank you so much. Incredible work. Um, I really miss being liaison with Merck because I love getting the reports of who's coming through every month. 
Um, so you gave us a little bit of a sense of that with your um, bookings chart here. Um, in terms of it being a welcoming community space, uh, I just want to make sure that you mentioned uh, your new security lead position. Um, is the budget resourced enough so that when that person uh, needs additional resources, trainings, materials, et cetera, we have room in the budget for uh, action to be taken to continue that work? Council President Peterson, Council Lewis, yes. I believe we have enough flexibility and that's a priority area that, that we will find the money if there's needs that, that would be positively and useful. So yes, we have the flexibility to do so. Great, I don't want us under-resourced in that area. Concur completely. Um, the other area that uh, I worry about but is uh, not directly in our scope of control is making sure that our food service workers that are contract uh, are getting what they need um, in terms of still getting full support uh, from us as the Metro contractor. You know, early in the new contract, we heard from some of those employees who are having trouble with their timesheets, some, some stuff that should be fairly basic for a large company. <coughs> Do you have staff capacity to continuously be monitoring to make sure the contract requirements are being met? Obviously, the food and service are great. I'm just making sure that the back end, the back of house business stuff is being taken care of. Councilor Lewis, yes, we meet. Um, I meet monthly with the general manager. Steve Falsig meets monthly with the general manager, and we get periodic report outs where we go through the. Um, the metrics and the uh, obligations embedded in the contract. Some are capital, some are operational, some are uh, performance. Um, and yes, so we, we do work through those things like time cards, time card anomalies. There's not a monthly standard conversation. That's as, as ad needed conversation as we learn about things. Um, but for the most part, uh, the, the contract metrics, if you will, are reviewed regularly and, and we're ensuring that they're moving along with us in a positive direction. Great, thank you. Thanks, Councilor Simpson, Gonzalez, and then Rosenthal. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Craig, and your staff for an amazing presentation. Uh, I know it's been a difficult time. We've all been through, and we're on the rebound, and that's obvious with the numbers we're seeing. Uh, I just have a small question, really, around the training and development coordinator's position. Um, how often do uh, career progression opportunities make themselves available for staff to seek promotion? Well, Council President, uh, Councilor Simpson, I'll, I'll take the first shot at that and then I'll let Michelle speak to some of the specifics. But um, I've been at OCC roughly six years, uh, just coming up on six years. And when I walked into the organization, the tenure was unbelievable. Um, it was, a, it was a, a, a place that people hired on and stayed and promoted potentially, but stayed for very, very long term. Um, we're in this rebuilding phase with uh, the pandemic where we lost countless numbers of staff and some chose to uh, maybe do other things or stick around and have rehired back. Some changed their career path and ha have gone on to other things. Um, but what we've seen is, is some really bright spots where uh, folks have matriculated up in the organization, maybe moved laterally into different career paths that have uh, more upward mobility. We've seen a fair amount of that. And it's very positive to have those opportunities to provide and then to see staff that, that are moving into those that have been with the organization. Yes, um, <laughs> I will just add that um, we also are just very mindful about communicating opportunities um, that is absolutely built into the um, digital device um, program because before um, employees didn't know their opportunities they, they weren't communicated those and so now we um, specifically identify them and with this training and development coordinator they would work with managers to see like where you know what employees are looking for where do they where their aspirations lie i mean we have been told um i've been told by um you know utility workers uh, my only path is being a manager i don't want to be a manager it's like there's a lot of opportunity out there um not just at occ but uh, as at metro as well so it's like finding those opportunities connecting the dots connecting the the folks and then giving them the skills and opportunities to build to where they can tackle those jobs and get them Thank you. Okay, Councilor Gonzalez. Uh, thanks, President Peterson. Um, yeah, I wanna agree with what Councilor Lewis and Councilor Simpson have shared. Um, and it, it really feels like our session today with the with, with uh, updates has been uh, full of uh, good news, optimistic 
um, signs, I guess you could say. Um, you know, I really um, am uh, uh, feeling hopeful, good, all those things with regards to the direction of OCC and the value that tourism offers to our economy, the role that that you know that 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 we play in in how the world accesses our region and how our region accesses the world. And um, I, I'm just really thrilled with the presentation today. Um, I appreciate that the uh, that the ask that uh, for for an increase is focused on investing in our people and in building skills um, and in continuing to make um, uh, the the venues uh, just a really really um, great place to work. And I, I I really applaud the 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 efforts taken to uh, uh, increase access to technology to. Uh, internal communication, um, as President Peterson mentioned earlier, um, it, it's just something that that brings me so much joy. Uh, when I when I was first elected, we we took a tour with uh, a lot of the 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 rep folks, um, and you know, really just hearing about you know people the that that love their job and just the little things that make such a big difference, um, and it, it feels like. We're, we're doing those things right now and, and I'm really grateful and I want to call that out um, and, and more than anything want to want to communicate that that this council is really um, supportive of of the work that you're doing and just you know whatever we can do thank you so much thank you <laughs> great uh, Councillor Rosenthal and then Wong uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to echo what the other councillors have said. Uh, kudos to uh, OCC and the staff. All the reports I hear are good. The food is, when I've been there, uh, the food is good and imaginative and, and tasty. Uh, and I've gotten reports from vendors at the recent coffee convention that the place was good and probably their preferable spot compared to the other national venues that they go to. And I, I think I mentioned I talked to one of the people who was affected by our recent contract negotiations and said actually things might be working out a little better than previously. So things look good. My only question is uh, we're with my uh, policy advisor, we're going around to the some of the outlying cities and talking about uh, economic drivers and economic things. And, and I mentioned um, the OCC as an important economic driver. Um, if you can give me one or two key points that I should be mentioning to these uh, regional councils that don't get to the OCC as often as they should, um, that would be appreciative. So, I mean, what are the key things I should be telling them? Sure. President Peterson, uh, Council Rosenthal, um, now you're in my wheelhouse, right? This is what we love to talk about. Um, what you can tell them is that OCC is part of a larger ecosystem. And, and for our national clients, is where the economic impact really comes from. It's over $400 a day that each delegate will spend in our region on services, um, goods, wares, travel, hotel, et cetera. But it's over $400 a day. But as part of that ecosystem, it's everything from the air flights in, the baggage handlers, the food service outlets at the airport that transition into you know, TriMet ridership, Lyft and Uber and, and taxi ridership. Um, they're going to stay in a hotel, and they're going to use the amenities of a hotel and all the service workers in that hotel. Uh, they're going to go out shopping. They're going to go to restaurants. Many of them will tack on a day before or after to head up to the wine country, to the, uh, to the coast, or up to Mount Hood. And so our economic impact, I think it's, it's a series of concentric circles. Obviously, the closer you get to downtown, the bigger that impact. But it is impacting the entire region and, and probably the entire state at some level, and the dollar amounts are not insignificant. That said, I will tell you that OCC, while we are relatively healthy, having come out of the pandemic, that's not true for many players in the ecosystem. Um, hotels, we were, we were told uh, two months ago that 70% of the hotels in the city are continuing to lose money. So they've, they've borne a couple of years now of pandemic losses, and that's continuing. It's really because uh, uh, leisure travel and business travel is down. Convention travel is up, but we're only a piece of the overall um, travel into the region. And so while we are relatively healthy, um, they're still struggling. And to me, that looks like jobs. That looks like jobs in those hotels. It looks like restaurants that depend upon those, those folks to come to lunch. You know, Think about the Lloyd area that we reside in and how 
how many fewer restaurants there are compared to pre-pandemic and, and loss of those own business owners and the jobs associated. So we're still in recovery. We're healthier than the ecosystem, I would say, in general. Um, and we're working diligently to try to reverse that. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Uh, Councillor Wong. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you for the presentation and all the great work. Uh, it seems like things are uh, recovering quite nicely. Um, I wanted to ch uh, shift the conversation just a bit to um, oops, the slides on kind of the um, diverse community and small business uses. Uh, and I, you know, really am excited that OCC is such a regional economic driver. Um, but I am actually really excited about kind of the diverse and small business uses. And you know, part of the, the I think what I'm seeing here is like the goal of OCC is to support regional commerce, but also be your friendly neighborhood convention center or uh, community gathering space. And I was wondering if you might expand a bit how we might like formalize that more programmatically or systematically. Um, I think you know, for a lot of our partners right now they're not sure how to access the convention center. And sometimes, you know, like depending on who you talk to, you might get different levels of, of service. So I'm wondering if, if there might be a plan to like make it more of a one-stop entry point for community partners to come talk to. Um, and then having a, like um, a specific and articulated layers of support that uh, community partners and small businesses might be able to access. Sure, Council President Peterson, Councilor Wong. Um, I think that's a multifaceted um, answer to your question. Uh, the first thing I can tell you, though, is that we're now in year four. We're entering year four of our racial equity action plan. And in that plan, there's a specific community outreach that Michelle Hedegaard spoke to around engaging those communities and seeing um, what their needs are and what their potential barriers could be to using the convention center. We know some of the obvious things. We're, we're not inexpensive. Um, we're a very large center. We're the largest center uh, in the Northwest. Well, that's not true as of January. Seattle is now the largest convention center in the Northwest. Um, but we're large, um, our spaces are large, they, they can configure down, but it, it's incremental costs on all. So we know costs, um, but, but we also know some of our clients have specific culinary needs and, and we work with them to, um, if Levy, our food and beverage provider, cannot provide the, the specific food types, the, the the client wants, then we allow them um, pathways to achieve that outcome, that vision for their event. But really this effort that will be forthcoming will be to reach out and identify what those barriers are. The other thing I would tell you at a more um, uh, global level is there's, there's um, policies put in place to ensure the center um, is made available to large convention clients. So our booking policies require that. Um, so when you get three years and beyond out, you can't reserve space in the center unless you have a room block of a certain level. It's like 1,350 rooms, and you're going to use uh, 140,000 um, square feet exhibit hall space. As the calendar draws closer, then we are able to open up the, the spaces that are not rented for those purposes to um, you know smaller um, and local. Um, so there's this tension between our, our pursuit of national um, clients and convention clients and local business. And so um, we'll continue to look at that, but our first order of business is to really understand what it is our community groups are looking for. Um, and the other thing I would tell you is, is we're not a, as skilled as we are, we're not a great incubator space. Um, there's like a progression that meetings and events go through as they're forming and developing that usually starts with, there's in a smaller space that's more amenable and more flexible and has the resources to kind of incubate them up. And actually what we see is we're, we're often a first convention space for clients um, where they've been in a single hotel. There's single hotels out there as large as our convention center that can hold, do everything we do in a single hotel. But if they're moving into a convention center, a lot of times we're their first convention center. Um, and so incubation is also like scale. Like, um, you know, they want to feel good in space and sometimes we're a little too big for, for that growth. So we're active, we understand the desire to do that. We agree with that and we're pursuing it. Uh, but there's some steps we need to take to gather information first. Michelle, I don't know if you have anything you'd add. I would agree. Yes. And when might, when might you have like a plan or findings from kind of the due diligence that you're doing now? 
I'm sorry, I, I missed that. One moment you have. Some oh, results yes. To share. So that, that effort with community engagement, we've got $100,000 set aside for support with that work. Um, that's slated for next year, fiscal year. So I imagine towards the end of next year, assuming that work moves forward, you know, with with normal pace, uh, process, uh, pace um, by the end of next year, we should we should have the information to begin really concretely addressing the issues. Great. I look forward to that. Thank and um, yeah, I really like the both end model where you're pursuing large out of town clients, but also uh, being accessible to our community as well here locally. Thanks. Thank you. I have one last question. I don't think there's any others. Um, on the new roof, not the new roof, sorry, on the leak issue, how far away from, are we from being in need of a new roof? I'm, I'm just wondering if we're just patching leaks that we know we're putting off a major capital project or if it's on the schedule for some sort of major overhaul. Yeah, Council President Peterson. Um, one thing the center has historically been really good at, and I need to compliment our facilities manager, Matt Uckman. Um, we've been really good at managing our, our capital asset. And so we, we actually put together a 10-year capital plan, and the roof is on that plan. It's, it's on about year seven. And that's, that's one of those, like, how long does the roof last? Um, it'll get assessed more and more diligently as we move to it. Um, the roof is in our issues right now. Uh, it's, it's the spires and the crescent with the, the glass panes. That's where it's the, leaking. We have what we call indoor rain, and it's cute and, and such, but it's, it's really not the guest experience that a tier one convention center wants to offer its clients. Um, so that, that work is all weather dependent. We began it last summer, and we've got a solution we believe is going to work with, with the original designer of those elements and installers of those glass panes. Um, and so now it's really... What does the summer look like from a construction window? We hope to move through um, all three of those pieces, but we'll just have to see. But yes, we have an extensive um, capital plan that includes our roof and all of our major equipment and, and physical plants. And, yep. and it's in the, the building is in great condition. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't want to make a mountain of a molehill. <laughs> um, but I didn't want to get to that issue because that's a significant undertaking to take all the solar off mm -hmm. as well and put it back on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe the roof, um, and I I believe this, this might not be accurate, but I That's believe okay. that the roof was um, constructed in two phases and that the solar is sitting on a, a, a more newer. newer version, and it's actually the other portions of the roof that are the okay. oldest sections of roof. Okay, okay, good to know, thank you. Much appreciated. Any other questions, counselors, with that? Seeing none, thank you, much appreciated. Looking forward to the next year and uh, continued, continued more uh, conferences, conventions, visitation. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. All right, counselors, uh, we'll move on to uh, COO communications. Thank you, President Peterson. Hello again, counselors. Um, just a, a quick and happy update uh, for you. Last week, um, Metro uh, and Several other partners closed on a, an affordable housing project on 74th and Gleason. This is a, uh, this was the first phase of a project that will have a, a family building, and that's the, the first piece that we close on, uh, with uh, 95 units that will rent for um, folks that are uh, at 30 to 60 percent of the area median income, um, and includes uh, quite a few three and four bedrooms. Um, which is really exciting news. Um, there's also a, an additional phase that's planned that will have um, permanent supportive housing as well as um, a, a school um, and a daycare, I believe, preschool um, in, in one corner. So um, exciting news. Um, a lot of different funds came together to make this one happen. Um, it involved our transit-oriented development program. It includes affordable housing bond funds and all, uh, for, for Metro and also the city of Portland, um, as well as state funding. So um, that's the update that I have for you. Thanks Great. for moving. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Counselors, any counselor communication? Seeing none. All right. Wow. Oh, oh, <laughs> last <laughs> second. <laughs> Councilor Rosenthal and Simpson. No. Oh, you didn't have anything? No, you got two. You got one on. Oh, we got hands up. Councilor Gonzalez, thank you. Yeah, so, sorry about that, President Peterson. But um, uh, first and foremost, I just want to uh, appreciate uh, all the staff and uh, members of the council that 
uh, helped cover for me while I was on my honeymoon. It was a, an amazing uh, few weeks with my wife uh, in Europe, and I'm really excited to be back. Um, and I just really wanted to um, thank, uh, in particular, uh, Councillor Lewis um, and Councillor Simpson, uh, Councillor Rosenthal, for a lot of the projects that we're working on together, that we share some kind of leadership role uh, for uh, just, you know, stepping in and, and doing an incredible job. Uh, it means a lot. And so I just really appreciate it and uh, uh, feeling really energized uh, to get to work with y'all. So uh, got a lot of work coming up and uh, especially with the RTP and we have our JPAC trip in, in June. So uh, I'm excited for all that, but again, um, wouldn't be possible without your support. So just wanted to, to thank you. Great, thank you. Councilor Rosenthal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, last week was sort of a busy week. Uh, first of all, I had a meeting with Sherwood on their Cedar Creek Trail Crossing. Now, as you know, we funded the um, extent or, or development of the Cedar Creek Trail, and then it comes, it, it has a culvert under Highway 99W, and so that's something that we, you know, we can't fund ODOT projects directly. At any rate, so uh, shout out to uh, Representative Neuron, both uh, she and, and Senator Wood's representatives were there at a meeting to talk about the, they're asking for $600,000 from the legislature. It's still live, whether ways and means will give it to them. Uh, so she's been a leader in that uh, regard, and that's something that'll probably come back to us, hopefully, for perhaps a trails. It's a, an important trail connection to the Tonkin Trail and goes to the Wildlife Refuge, so that's important. Um, I also give a shout out to uh, Representative Duran for her activism on this recent issue with the tolling and the, the whatever we call it. Uh, there's been a, some, a break in the tolling process. Um, I had the opportunity, fortunately, to attend the uh, regional Clackamas County Cities uh, meeting and had some good discussions with Canby and with uh, Happy Valley. Uh, as usual, I asked uh, the mayor of Happy Valley, so what can Metro do to help? And his response was sort of interesting. Sort of said, well, Ed, we're doing okay. Just let us do our thing. So I thought that was sort of an interesting response. And uh, Canby, of course, was worried about uh, the tolling project and diversion. Uh, so, and they're also working, you know, they're not in our district, but uh, they do contribute uh, people that come into the district to work. Uh, the Oregon League of Conservation Voters was an interesting uh, meeting. A lot of people attended, and as I mentioned to, to uh, Craig Stroud, the food was good, and uh, it was quite enlightening. Uh, it, it emphasizes, however, the gap that we still are working on from housing in terms of developing wealth by getting people to own housing, not just providing rental. It's, not, it's something that I know our housing team is working on. Uh, and Roadshow, we had a roadshow with the city of Wilsonville last night, which talking about all the things that Metro does. Um, Metro staff is, uh, they were very happy about this new agreement we have with them about hazardous waste. We're going to be having hazardous waste events probably once a year in the fall with, uh, with Wilsonville. They're good about that. Um, and we promoted some of the sponsorship alternatives. They were interested in knowing how they could get into things like uh, a regional refresh and uh, how they could get some of these community groups to contact us. And uh, 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 Eduardo Ramos gave them some you know, detailed information on how to contact it. There was also a good presentation on the Oregon Institute of Technology, which has a campus in Wilsonville and provides some very important training services uh, and that was sort of interesting. The president of the college was there, or the university, I guess they now call themselves. And finally, I have to report on a personal thing that, that uh, both Councillor Lewis and I would be very happy about. I, I noticed that we finally acquired, or are will helping the city acquire a couple hundred feet along Crystal Springs Creek, which, as you know, is a major source of water and vi visual additive to the Reed College campus and uh, something that we all paid a lot of attention to and never went swimming in because it was not safe. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> a note to safety. <laughs> all right, Councillor Simpson. Uh, yep, yeah, I, I had to step out for a minute. I wanted to thank Steve Falstick and his staff. Uh, this June, June 17th, we will be having the eight second Juneteenth rodeo, first ever black rodeo. Uh, at the Expo Center. Um, his team pulled off of Hail Mary. Uh, <laughs> in such a short amount of time, we were able to get it planned and everything. And so, uh, also, big shout out to the Visitor Development Fund. Um, they were the, one of the key sponsors to making sure that that happened. So, uh, I'll make sure all that information gets out to everybody. Get your tickets, dust off your boots, get your hat, and let's go. 
<laughs> I have so much gear from being a Clackamas County Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sparkles. Anyway, thank you. That's good news. Congratulations. Good news. Great. All right, with that, anybody else? But we are adjourned. Thank you for a good another good meeting. June seventeenth. Recording stopped. The way it sounds like. Oh, sounds like a lot of fun. I have not been.